In the year 1722, a small band of religious refugees from the modern-day Czech Republic settled into Germany in land owned by a guy by the name of Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf. And for the next five years, this community called the Moravians, these Moravian uh, people, uh, they were embroiled, their community was embroiled in dissension and bickering, and yet Zinzendorf and other leaders from the community covenanted together to pray, to pray for, uh, for healing and for God's work among these, again, these, these religious refugees. And then on August 13th, 1727, revival came. Dissensions dissolved, forgiveness permeated the community, and then began a 24-hour prayer meeting that lasted for 100 years. 24 hours a day, every day for 100 years. This was this amazing 100-year prayer meeting of the Moravian Church. Interesting how prayer uh, was so effective. Within 65 years, the Moravian refugees, this small band of people that had settled on the land of Ludwig von Zinzendorf, they had sent over 300 missionaries around the world within 65 years. And we, we would surmise largely on account of the fact that God answered prayers. Here we are uh, in the month of September now, and for uh, the last week of, of August into September, we are looking at big prayers from the Old Testament, big prayers from the Old Testament. And our, our goal with this sort of mini-series is not just to study these prayers as academic topics, not just to sort of dive deep and draw out inf information, uh, but we want to hear, we want to learn, and we want to imitate and be inspired to pray ourselves. So it's my desire, it's my hope, that as we talk about these prayers from the Old Testament, that our, our hearts are stirred to pray likewise in our own lives. And we're going to find time even during the, the, the service to do so. Last week, we looked at the prayer of King Jehoshaphat. If you were here with us, you remember, the prayer was, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That was King Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now, this week, we look at the prayer of Habakkuk. Habakkuk. If you have a Bible, I'm going to give you a little extra time to find the book of Habakkuk because that's kind of a small one tucked into the latter books of the Old Testament. Uh, by the way, if you have a Bible and you're not terribly familiar with where the books are, use the table of contents. There's always a table of contents at the very beginning of the Bible. To find a book like Habakkuk might be a little bit tricky. Even if you've been in church for decades, it can be a little tricky. Anyways, the prayer that we're looking at this morning from Habakkuk is this prayer, the title of the sermon, In Wrath remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. Perhaps we're more comfortable with the word mercy than wrath. I don't know about you. Wrath feels a little bit heavy. Mercy feels really good. Uh, in fact, it's not that uncommon for people to think that the God of the Old Testament, that's the God of wrath. And the God of the New Testament, that's the God of mercy. Uh, but I don't think that's true. A, a proper understanding of God makes sense makes space for both, for both wrath and mercy. In fact, I don't think it's possible for us to understand the gospel itself without bringing together both wrath and mercy. So uh, this morning, we're going to talk about this prayer, In Wrath, Remember Mercy, from the book of Habakkuk. Again, our text is Habakkuk. We're going to look specifically at chapter 3. It's a short book. We're going to look at chapter 3, the third of three chapters, uh, specifically verse 2, where that prayer is found. And though our focus is on chapter 3, verse 2, which is kind of like the theme verse for the entire book, uh, this verse is going to lead us like a root system to other places throughout the book. So you'll, you'll hear me going to various places to kind of unpack the book as a whole. So if, again, if you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to open up and, and just start in chapter 3, verse 2. And as we close, we're going to allow some reflections from this text to prepare us uh, to take communion, because this being the first Sunday of the month, we're going to take communion together, and hopefully we'll be enriched in our communion time together, uh, having spent some time in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. So let me read the verse. In fact, why don't we read the verse together? You'll see it there on the screen, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. Let's read this together in unison on the count of three, all right? One, two, three. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. There it is, the very end of chapter 3, verse 2. In wrath, remember mercy. Now, something about this guy, Habakkuk. Uh, by the way, I love the name Habakkuk. In Kenya, Rwanda, the language that I spoke there in Rwanda for 14 years, they call him Habakuki. And Habakuki reminds me of Cookie Monster. Habakuki. 
So I just love the name Habakkuk. It just it makes me feel something special. Uh, anyway, Habakkuk was a prophet that prophesied at the very latter part of the 7th century B.C. So roughly 600 and 10 years before Jesus was born, Habakkuk was a prophet in the southern kingdom of Judah at a time when the country was experiencing incredible distress, both from within and from without, internal and external distress. Internally, and we're going to see some of the symptoms here in just a moment, internally, the nation faced problems of oppression, injustice, exploitation of rich and powerful people taking advantage of poor and powerless people. And then externally, that was just internally among the people of Judah, externally, the nation encountered threats, threats originating from foreign powers such as Assyria, which was the dominating power throughout the 8th century into the 7th century, and then also Babylon, which in the recent past had overtaken Assyria in the Battle of Carchemish. So it's the substance of these two crises, both internal and external, that comprise the bulk of the book. So again, Habakkuk is coming at a time of incredible distress for the people of Judah. Now, Habakkuk begins the book, chapter 1 and chapter 2, the two chapters preceding our key verse for this morning. He begins with a couple of complaints. Uh, this is a great book because basically it's structured around two complaints and then God's answer. The complaints are basically these two things. Number one, the first complaint is, this is coming from chapter 1, verse 2, he complains to the Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you won't hear? Who is he complaining to? He's complaining to God. Can you imagine such outrageous words being spoken to God? But he does it, and it's in the Bible nonetheless. How long shall I cry to help and you will not hear, God? Habakkuk, again, has observed evil among the people that he believes ought to be demonstrating integrity. And he complains, God, you're doing nothing about it. The leaders, the, the people who are in leadership over the politics, over the religious system, the leaders are failing. The leaders are exploiting. The leaders are manipulating. And he's saying, God, you're doing nothing about it. What are you doing? Chapter 1, verse 4, this is how he describes it. He says, the law is paralyzed. Now, where did the law come from in the Old Testament? It came from God. The law is paralyzed. Justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Again, he's talking about internal dynamics among the people of Judah. God, why do you do nothing, he says. And so God answers Habakkuk in chapter 1, verse 5, and he says, I am going to do something. He says, chapter 1, verse 5, look among the nations and see Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told you. I'm doing something about it. And then he tells him what he's doing. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Now the Chaldeans, that's another, we might, we might substitute the word Babylonians. Maybe you're more familiar with the Babylonians. God has heard. God has seen and God will respond to the problems of Judah's sin by raising up the Babylonians. Again, 610 B.C., God allows the Babylonians to defeat the Assyrians. And indeed, in defeating the Assyrians, they take over all that is west of the Jordan, including the potential to take over the area where Judah is found. God has heard, God will respond to the problems of Judah's sin. God is responding to the problems of internal dissension of Judah's sin by raising up the Babylonians against Judah. And then again, in 605 B.C., the Babylonians defeat the Egyptians and they establish control over the region, including Judah. Just like that. 605 B.C., we have the first deportation of Jews to Babylon. It's likely when Daniel went to Babylon. It's happening. God is bringing judgment on his people, the Jews, because of the things that Habakkuk is seeing. Now, this response of God to the problem, the internal problems of Judah, also raises questions. There's another complaint. There's two complaints. The second complaint comes in chapter 1, verse 13. Complaint number two. Why do you idly look at traitors? 
and remains silent when the wicked swallows up the righteous. Why do you idly look at traitors? In other words, he's here talking about the Babylonians. We might imagine like five years have passed between complaint number one and complaint number two. Complaint number one, God, do something. He says, I'm raising up the Babylonians. Complaint number two, five years later, now, God, I'm seeing how you're responding to the first complaint. How can you possibly do this? How can you stoop to such a level, you being a holy and perfect God, how can you stoop to such a level to use the evil Babylonians? The Babylonians are are oppressive, and he's going to actually use language, chapter 1, verse 15, talking about dragging people along with a hook and and drawing them out with a net, gathering them with a dragnet. How can you possibly use such oppressive people, such people who are indiscriminate in their brutality? How can you possibly use people who are godless, ruthless, barbaric? God, how in the world can you possibly do this? Use the Babylonians. Uh, pharmaceutical commercials. This reminds me of pharmaceutical commercials. No offense to the pharmacists out there. I'm sure you've seen those pharmaceutical commercials in which at the very end, there's a voice that speed reads. I mean, you've got to have a gift for this to speed read the potential side effects. Warning this, warning this medication might cause rashes, trouble breathing, indigestion, dizziness, mood change, memory loss, hallucinations, blood clots, compulsive behaviors, birth defects, cancer, thoughts of suicide, and death. The cure seems worse than the disease itself, right? When you hear all those side effects, you think, I'd just rather just die with my ailments. Because the cure seems worse than the symptom or the sickness itself. And that's kind of what what Habakkuk is feeling here. Habakkuk's sentiment is just like that. God, you who are of pure eyes, this is chapter 1, verse 13. God, how can you who are of pure eyes than to see evil... How can you, who do not look at wrong, how can you use the Babylonians? The disease was the sinfulness of your people, but the Babylonians, God, the cure is worse than the disease itself. And so again, God answers, this time with less specificity, but he answers that the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that they too will get their comeuppance, but in his time, that God will bring about justice, But again, in his time, chapter 2, chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, this is the Lord's answer to the second complaint. The Lord answered me, again, this is Habakkuk, the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. In other words, it has not yet been fulfilled, but it's going to happen. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it, for it will surely come. It will not delay. It is as certain as the character of God, he's saying. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not right upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. In other words, the Lord is in his holy temple. Chapter 2, verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. He sees the oppression of the Babylonians, and he will execute justice. But in the meantime, Habakkuk is left waiting, waiting for God's intervention, waiting for God to fulfill his word, waiting for that vision that will not tarry, but yet it kind of does. He's waiting for God to do what God promises to do. And so what does Habakkuk do while he waits? He prays. And that's chapter 3. That's the chapter that we're in this morning. Chapter 3, he prays. Chapter 3, I'm going to look specifically at the, verse, at the first verse of that prayer. Verse 2. O Lord, I have heard the report of you. In your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. Habakkuk had heard of God's work in the past. Habakkuk had heard of what God could do in the past, how God had led the Israelites out of Egypt. Remember that phenomenal story about how God led the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt with signs and wonders, and he led them right up to the cusp right up to the banks of the of the Red Sea, and Moses stretched out his hands over the waters. Exodus chapter 14, verse 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Like that's how, that's how pervasive God's deliverance was. 
This huge army chasing this, this band of misfits across the Red Sea. There they are, bodies strewn across the, across, along, the, along the Red Sea. Verse 31, Israel saw, that's an important word here this morning, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord. And they believed the Lord. They saw and they feared. For Moses' generation, it was seeing and fearing. Habakkuk didn't get the chance to see that story. He only heard it. You can only imagine he'd heard it through generations passing down the story from generation to generation. He'd heard the story until 800 years later. He can say, I have heard. I haven't seen it, but I've heard this is the kind of God you are. I've heard your legacy, God. I've heard your reputation, and I fear you. Hearing and fearing, not seeing and fearing, but hearing and fearing. And he says, but now, God, I want to see it in my day. I want to see it in my day. I want to see it. I want to see the evidence, God, that you are the kind of God that you say you are. Years ago, I had a colleague in ministry in, in Rwanda who said he could break dance. Now, if you knew this guy, he's nerdy. And so I expected him to show me his collection of microscopes. Like, that's no offense to people who collect microscopes, but I kind of figured, like, if this guy's got a, a collection or a talent, it's probably like looking at things and telling me all sorts of big words that I didn't understand. He said that he could break dance. And so finally at a party, we said to him, we've heard of your skill, now show us what you can do. And sure enough, he did. He could legitimately break, I mean, this is me giving the assessment, I have no idea what that ought to look like, but he did at a little party in the middle of Africa. We had a great time. Anyways. I've heard of it, now show me. That's what Habakkuk is saying. Habakkuk is saying something like this. God, we've heard of your reputation. We want to see it in our day. Prove it. Show it to us. Let us see it in our day. Let us see it with our own eyes. Let us see how you resolve the problem of the internal things and the external things, the problems of wickedness within the world, the problems of wickedness within the world. God, show us how you fix this. And then with the final phrase of chapter 3, verse 2, Habakkuk's prayer seemingly ties together the whole book. He says, in wrath, remember mercy. Let me read that whole verse again. He says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you. In your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years right now, revive it. In the midst of the years right now, God, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And so that's kind of where I want to hover for some time this morning. In wrath, remember mercy. Those are big words. Those are loaded words, wrath and mercy. First, let's talk about wrath. In Hebrew, the word wrath has the idea of shaking or quaking. Not out of fear, but out of anger. It's the, it's the word used for the earth quaking under the pounding of an advancing army. Can you feel that? It's the word used for mountains feeling like they're quaking during a thunderstorm. And it's the word used for God's rage against evil. God shakes with anger and wrath towards evil. In the history of Habakkuk, it was the wrath of God that raised up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, to bring judgment on Judah. In Habakkuk's day, it was his wrath that provoked him to promise punishment upon the Babylonians because God quakes and rages against evil, all that is the antithesis of his holiness. In the New Testament, Paul identifies the wrath of God as the greatest problem facing mankind. What's the greatest problem facing mankind? Is it hunger? No. Is it climate change? No. According to Paul, the greatest problem facing humankind is God's wrath. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. The problem of Judah that incited God's wrath was the problem of the Chaldeans that incited God's wrath. That is the problem of every human being. This is the problem of every human being. This is the problem of every human being. Sin. And sin incites the quaking anger 
of God's wrath. Aren't you glad you came to church today to hear this? The first great awakening was largely inspired by the conviction of God's wrath against sin. The first great awakening coming in the the 18th century, the 1700s. Jonathan Edwards was that famous Congregationalist preacher from New England. He preached his most famous sermon, uh, monotone, barely able to see in a dark room. He preached this famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, I, when I was a student growing up in Connecticut, just maybe 15 miles away from where Edwards preached this sermon, uh, of course, like 300 years earlier, but uh, I remember uh, reading this in a public school. This was a part of U.S. literature, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And the, the, the recognition and the awareness of the wrath of God was one of the things that God used to bring about great revival in the 18th century. Listen to just a paragraph from Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Just listen to the imagery here. O sinner, Edward says, consider the fearful danger you are in. It is a great furnace of wrath, a wide and bottomless pit, full of the fire of wrath, that you are held over in the hand of that God whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with its flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and burn it asunder. And you have no interest in any mediator and nothing to lay hold of save yourself. Nothing to keep off the flames of wrath. Nothing of your own. Nothing that you have ever done. Nothing that you can ever do to induce God to spare you for one moment, he says. This is an uncomfortable, a very uncomfortable truth. The truth is that God detests evil, eternally detests evil. Yet as uncomfortable as that truth may be, the wrath of God is as much an attribute of his perfection as is his love. So then it is appropriate for us to contemplate the wrath of God. If we're going to believe in the God who is real, then we're going to believe that this God is also a God of wrath. In fact, the more we consider God's hatred of sin, the more likely we are to recognize its heinousness in our own lives. So, before we move off of the topic of wrath here this morning, don't take lightly in your own life the presence of sin. Don't take lightly the problem of sin, the pervasive problem of sin, not just in your life, but in the lives of people around you. If if God doesn't take sin lightly, then neither should we, either again in my life or in your life or in life in general. God's wrath against sin is ultimately, again, the greatest problem facing humanity. Full stop. But there's more. Habakkuk prays, in wrath, remember mercy. Mercy. This one feels a little bit better. We had to talk about God's wrath because we don't appreciate mercy until we understand wrath. Mercy is another picturesque word. If wrath was trembling, trembling and shaking, quaking like, a, like the mountains in a thunderstorm, mercy is another picturesque word associated with the womb. The womb. The word refers to the deep love Deep love rooted in a very natural bond. The word mercy refers to the perfect love of a parent for his or her own child. With respect to God, the word mercy refers to his unconditional affection, the affectionate bond between God and his children. The affectionate bond between God and his children. Again, if wrath is an uncomfortable truth, mercy is an extremely comfortable truth. God is inclined towards his people, and God's people suckle at his mercy. We go back to it day after day, and this is why the author of Lamentations can write those beautiful words, again, written at very much the same time, in very much the same historical context as the book of Habakkuk. The author of Lamentations can write, This I call to mind, therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He goes back to them over and over. He's seeing the wrath of God play out in the destruction of Jerusalem. And he can say, your mercies are new every day. 
So likewise, Habakkuk, because God is merciful, he can write, he can write, Habakkuk in this book that's before us this morning, he can write. At the very end of this book, again, this verse is like a, it's like the, the tree stump coming out under which there's a root system that takes us all over these three chapters. Habakkuk, because God is merciful, in light of the fact that God is a God of wrath, he can, he can, he can then speak of mercy as he, as he closes this book, thinking of God's wrath first. Look with me at chapter 3, verse 16. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 16, thinking of God's wrath, he says, I hear and my body trembles. It's not a good thing, by the way. That's not a good trembling. He's he hears of God's wrath, what God intends to do, that vision that will not tarry. He says, I hear and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound, rottenness enters into my bones. This is not a happy verse. My legs tremble beneath me at the thought of wrath, O oh God. Yet, thinking now of mercy, still in verse 16, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places because not only is he a God of wrath, but he is a God of mercy. And again, the New Testament picks up on the same themes. Paul clarifies again that the, that, that the mercy of God is the hope for sinners. The greatest problem facing humankind is the wrath of God, not even their own sin, because, well, perhaps God could just kind of overlook it. No, the greatest problem facing mankind, humankind, is the wrath of God. And again, Paul clarifies that the mercy of God is the hope for sinners. Look again at that, at that definition up there. The affectionate bond between God and his children. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, being rich in what? Mercy. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were, according to chapter 2, verse 3 of Ephesians, even when we were objects of wrath, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together in Christ. The mercy of God. The mercy of God. Because of the mercy of God, the wrath of God. I'll say it again. Because of the mercy of God, the wrath of God is poured out on his son, Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. The greatest problem facing humankind is the wrath of God. But because of the mercy of God, God's affectionate love for his people, because of the mercy of God, the wrath of God of God is poured out on his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The story is told of a woman who approached Napoleon on behalf of her son, seeking a pardon. The emperor declared that the young man had committed a heinous offense and de 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 deserved judgment, deserved death, demanded death. And the woman said, I'm not asking for justice, I'm pleading for mercy. Napoleon replied, but he does not deserve mercy. Sir, she said, it would not be mercy if it was deserved. And mercy is all he needs. Friends, we don't deserve mercy. We deserve wrath. But because of the gospel, God gives us mercy. God does not extend mercy because I deserve it. God does not extend mercy because he's impressed with my good character. Because God sees my good deeds. Get rid of that kind of thinking. God does not extend mercy to me because somehow he finds me to be, be a relatively good guy. That my good outweighs my evil. No, God does not extend mercy to me because of anything that has to do with me. It is the work of Christ upon the cross, enduring the wrath of God, ending the wrath of God that moves God to treat me with mercy. And because God's wrath is satisfied by the death of Christ, it is the eternal pleasure of God to pour mercy 
on those who trust Jesus for their salvation. Uh, let me just say that again. It is the eternal pleasure of God to pour mercy every day, all the time, on those who are trusting in Jesus for their salvation. Because Jesus has absorbed the wrath of God on our behalf. Wow. Habakkuk's prayer, yeah, yeah. This is exciting. This is the gospel. Habakkuk's prayer rises from the deep awareness that no one can endure God's wrath. No one can survive the trembling anger of God against sin. And so he prays in wrath, remember mercy. This is the prayer of salvation in wrath, remember mercy. When we see our sin not just as a private dysfunction, you know, a lot of times in society, we just call it like, eh, it's just a dysfunction. It's not really, we don't think about sin. That's, that's, a, that's a hard word. Uh, when we see our sin not just as a private dysfunction, not just as a sickness, but even more as an offense against God, we must either bury ourselves in distractions, ignore our offense, or come face to face with God and beg for mercy. And hallelujah, God remembers mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. He has remembered. He has, past tense. And he continues to, but he has, in past tense, remembered mercy because he has provided his one and only son. This is our verse, folks. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus absorbed the wrath of God. Jesus was, in the language of Isaiah, I love Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, Jesus was crushed for our iniquities so that we can be forgiven, called his children, permanently live, not as objects of his wrath, but as objects of his affectionate love. Ha. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He made it white as snow. As we bring our time in God's word to a close, I want to invite Beth and the worship team to come and prepare to lead us in a song. And we're going to take communion together. We're going to take communion, but we're going to do it a little bit differently today. Because we've spent this time in Habakkuk talking about wrath and mercy, I think it's appropriate for us to add in a little bit of extra time just to simply respond. This is a, about big prayers from the Old Testament. We want to contemplate the character of God, the, the, the wrath of God poured out upon Jesus and the mercy of God extended to all those who put their faith in Jesus. So in just a few moments, uh, we're going to sing uh, a, a great song that's going to invite us to reflect on this. And, and then I'm going to give you some time before we take the communion elements. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're trusting in Jesus for your salvation, I want to invite you to participate in this communion service, even if you're not a regular attender here at our church. If you're a parent here with children, um, I would ask you to use your discretion, knowing whether or not your children are ready for this. Um, at a minimum, I would say it's important that your children have a, have a, a, tr a believing, trusting uh, relationship with Christ as their Savior. Communion service is comprised of two elements, a piece of bread and a cup of juice. The piece of bread symbolizes the body of Christ broken for us. The little cup of juice symbolizes the blood of Christ shed for our forgiveness. Folks, we're celebrating in these two little things, bread and juice, we're symbolizing what Jesus has done based on what we've already talked about in this verse, by absorbing the wrath of God so that we might live in the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God. A few moments, for just a few moments now, you'll see a couple of prayer prompts on the screen. I want to take a, I want to invite you to take, again, quietly, you can pray in your own heart. If you'd like to pray out loud, just quietly to yourself, that's okay as well. Three prayer prompts that I want, to, want you to walk through. Number one, remember your sin. Remember your sin, how your sinfulness was more than just a, a blemish. It was an eternal offense, eternal offense against God. Take some time to remember your sinfulness. And then celebrate the gospel after you've thought a little about your sinfulness, celebrate the gospel that Jesus absorbed the wrath of God that was yours so that you can know God's mercy. And then thirdly, praise God for his mercy, that he has forgiven you, that he has made you the object of his affection. And that's what it is, mercy upon mercy in your life. So again, I'm going to invite you to take some time just to quietly pray in your own heart. We're going to give you a couple minutes to do this, and then we'll continue singing verse 3.
merciful Heavenly Father, we come into your presence acknowledging that if it had not been for your mercy, we would have had no hope as sinners. So we are grateful, our hearts are in a posture of gratitude this morning, knowing that we are counted among your children, your sons and daughters, not because of the goodness that you observed in us, but because of the goodness that you observed in your son. Thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of Jesus upon the cross that resolves the greatest problem against us. In wrath, you have remembered mercy. We give great praise to you for that. Be honored, Lord, with our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.